All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy that you all uh, joined here and uh, today for our presentation about next level bone health, leveraging AI in X-ray incidental findings and introducing the TBS version 4. Um, without any further ado, I would like to kick off this presentation. My name is Christine Lenk. I am the product lead for the version 4. But uh, first, I will hand over to our radiology expert, Dr. Gregory Nicola, um, who will talk about the relevance of incidental findings in radiology. So, thank you. Welcome. Hello, everybody. So, I'm going to focus on what's happening in the radiology market and where radiologists, okay, sure, where radiologists are, are starting to do, how they're innovatively trying to practice population health. Okay, I have a few disclosures, including I'm being paid for this lecture. Okay, so imaging is rich in lots of data, especially a CAT scan that you use on a patient for the emergency room. There's lots of data in it. And in America, we've defined data that um, is not part of why you're doing the study, but is important. So for example, a patient might come into the emergency department with belly pain, and you find a tumor on the kidney. It's not causing the belly pain. And we have a term for that in radiology, and that's basically an actual internal finding. And uh, a colleague of mine, um, Chris Moore, and myself, and a group of us wrote a paper defining, a, a white paper defining what you do with actual internal findings. And how we define those is it's a mass or a lesion um, by imaging performed for an unrela unrelated reason, and that a follow-up is recommended because it could harm the patient in the near term. It could be a cancer. It turns out 30% of imaging studies done in the emergency department actually have an actual internal finding. So what about all these other things we see on imaging studies? For example, we often see vascular calcifications of major arteries, or we see very poor muscle mass in somebody who probably doesn't have a really you know, pr um, active life. Um, we see somebody who has a lot of visceral fat. Um, or we can possibly even look at bone mineral density or trabecular bone and find a patient who's at risk for fracture of the spine. Um, we can also look at the liver for fatty liver and pre-liver diseases. Are these really actual internal findings? Are these something that's gonna kill the patient or harm the patient in the next few months or year? Um, not really, so you, you really have to think about, well, what, what are these and are these important to find? And, and the truth is, these are markers for disease and they're markers for chronic disease. For example, vascular calcifications, oops, are markers for atherosclerotic disease. Poor muscle mass is a, a marker for a condition of sarcopenia. Um, a lot of visceral fat could be a marker of metabolic syndrome. Poor bone, bone mineral density or microarchitecture is somebody who's at risk for osteoporosis. Um, fatty liver could be a risk factor for more chronic liver diseases. So these are potentially very important things to mention and follow up but they don't really fit into actual incidental findings. So how would you define these? And the imaging community is starting to define these. And we're thinking of these as kind of screening for chronic diseases. And so when you look at the World Health Organization's definition of screening, it's basically to identify people um, in a health, apparently healthy population that are high risk for a, a, a chronic problem. And that a treatment or intervention can be intervened and, and potentially impact the mortality or morbidity of the disease. So these other things we find on CAT scan really kind of fit into are we screening for conditions? However, you know, screening has its own key criteria and definitions um, in population health. And these are really the most important things is are those other conditions we're looking for, are they an important health problem? And certainly when you think of bone health, osteoporosis certainly is. Um, can we detect the condition in the preclinical phase? Um, does the does treatment of the disease offer actually a benefit? If you can't treat it, then what's the purpose of really finding it or mentioning it except for maybe even to provoke anxiety? Um, the test itself that you're finding the disease on should meet acceptable levels of accuracy and cost. Now, this is really talking about a test done for screening reasons like a DEXA or a, a mammogram, but we're talking about a test already done for an another reason and that we're finding these conditions. So this one doesn't necessarily apply. And the screening test has to have specific requirements on what's acceptable follow-up. So you can see it, 
almost meets the screening definition. It doesn't really meet the actual incidental finding definition if you find it on a CAT scan done for another reason. And we've coined a word for what this really is, and it's called opportunistic screening. And a group of colleagues and myself wrote about um, kind of an expert panel on what we think opportunistic screening is and the barriers and challenges of implementing it on, on routine imaging done for other reasons. And this is an article we wrote in radiology. And the definition is here for you to see. And then this is finding those other conditions on CAT scan are really opportunistic screening. And within this article, we talked about some important challenges. And these are real challenges. One of the reasons why there hasn't been a huge uptake of this inside radiology in general. One is workload challenges. This requires a radiologist, or hopefully in the future, software supporting the radiologist to track and find these conditions and then report them in a way that is um, easy for the referring clinician or the patient to make sure that they go and have proper follow-up or treatment. So what we're starting to see in this market is that we're starting to see software help us discover these conditions. We're starting to see software produce actionable reports, possibly with treatment recommendations or classifications of patients. And this becomes vital because it's a real problem, workload challenges. Um, uh, doctors really already have their plate full. To add more data to their plate is very difficult without taking some of that burden off of them. Um, the costs and payments is a real challenge in opportunistic screening. There really is not going to be a payment, an independent, in the United States we use CPT codes, you're not going to have an independent CPT code for bone mineral density done on a CAT scan. Now there's nuances to that and the reason is CPT strictly requires that you're doing something new that a radiologist can't do. So a radiologist could potentially look at um, compression fracture or bone mineral density. They might not be able to, they can't look with their eye and determine a trabecular bone score though. So a trabecular bone score might be able to be a billable surface, but just looking at bone mineral density, we could do that with Hounsfield units and that's probably not payable, but trabecular bone score is a new thing where we can't do with our eyes, that's potentially payable. Um, we also have to make sure that the patient understands why we're doing it, what are the implications of it, what the treatment challenges are, what the follow-up. Um, there's lots of technical challenges on implementing this on routine imaging. Um, for example, how, how to even integrate it into PACS, or how to integrate it into your voice recognition system, or just workflow. And there's lots of regulatory hurdles where if you create a software to detect some of these incidental findings, there are FDA clearance um, problems, there are certain uh, classification problems you have to deal with on the regulatory side. But, but the upside is pretty enormous. The fact is that you're really starting to make an impact on population health. Um, radiologists, if you practice this way, really have uh, a lot of access to data. You could conceivably go through your PACS database with one of these software packages. For example, if TBS could go through your PACS database and de identify patients at risk for osteoporosis, you have a whole new marketing campaign in front of you where you can say, wow, this to, you can give letters to clinicians saying, this is a patient population that is at risk for osteoporosis. You should send them to us for DEXA and a formal TBS. So there's lots of things you can do with that data that really empower your practice um, when you start practicing opportunistic screening. And then of course, the most important thing is that we're gonna benefit patient outcomes. So again, bone health is a story of missed opportunity. Um, there are 70% of the population is not diagnosed properly for osteoporosis. Uh, opportunistic screening really expands the number of people we can screen outside of those formally being referred for DEXA. 50% um, of patients with a DEXA are incompletely diagnosed, and certainly we know from talks we heard yesterday and what Christine will say that TBS is additive. We can really catch more of those patients who are at risk for osteopenic compression fractures. Um, and then there's lots of implant revisions that are um, had to be done because loosening inst inst redone because of loosening instability about 30 percent. If we can define that pe population up front, we can really reduce those numbers. And it's a huge problem worldwide. 200 million people worldwide have osteoporosis. 8.9 million osteoporotic fractures a year. Um, 19 billion dollars in U.S. spend. 37 billion dollars in euros. So this is a global problem. It's a, a disease that does not garnish a lot of attention. 
and with new modalities and new ways to capture this data, I, I expect this to be really the forefront of some of modern radiology and where we're going to be taking the profession. So, Thank you, Greg. So uh, you will understand at the end of uh, my second part of this presentation on why we actually talk about opportunistic screening and, and incidental findings, because this is where we are also heading towards uh, as Medimaps and with the TBS enterprise. So uh, for anybody who is new to the TBS, what is it? It is uh, a score, the trabecular bone score, which uh, is acquired from DEXA images. So you don't need to do any extra assessment of your patients. It's really a post-processing analysis of, uh, of existing de uh, DEXA images. And the TBS is closely related to the tra trabecular microarchitecture. And it is independent of the BMD. So by analyzing this, the same image, you will get additional information about the bone health status of your patient that otherwise is lost. And this is how it actually looks like. Um, here we have two DEXA images which read the same BMD. So just from the BMD outcome, you wouldn't know a difference of who of those two patients would be at higher risk of an osteoporotic fracture. However, when you then run the TBS analysis on these scans, you will get an information about the trabecular microarchitecture and uh, a heat map and a score with it. And here you can see that uh, the patient on the top has a, a high, a good TBS, whereas the patient on the top, uh, on the bottom, has a low TBS. And that means uh, you will have uh, additional information to classify the risk of your patient, which is plotted here, and we call this the bone fragility index. So here you have plotted the BMD T-score categories, and on the side you have the TBS. And uh, as we know and also discussed in the workshop yesterday, many patients, up to 50%, actually suffer an osteoporotic fracture when they don't have an osteoporotic BMD yet. So how to capture them? And if we look here, the osteopenia patients, if they also have a degraded TBS, actually fall into the same risk categories as patients with an osteoporotic uh, BMD T-score. And that means uh, that those patients would actually be eligible for osteoporotic treatment and you could capture them before they actually have a fracture. And this is what the TBS does. So uh, currently TBS is already well known within the United States. It's been here since 2012 and since two years ago it is also reimbursed and we have some more information on that or you were here yesterday. Um, and also worldwide it is uh, already well established. We also have a big, big publication base. So if you're interested in the TBS in various diseases and disease categories, come and see us. We can provide you extensive literature and background for various health, bone health related disease. So now the big question is why version 4? What are we doing? So up today, uh, TBS has been a standalone on-prem software, meaning that you install it on the workstation of your DEXA scanner and uh, the software reads uh, the, the database of the DEXA scanner and produces the TBS reports. And that's basically all it does and it does so very well. But uh, uh, what about interconnectivity? for example? What if you have several uh, systems, DEXA systems in your network? What about having a, a harmonized report? So uh, because of the new requirements that uh, are in your daily user workflow and also the potential to integrate with packs and to go to I different image modalities like X-ray, we have decided to completely redesign um, the software with uh, preserving the functionality that you already know. So uh, the first user interface looks uh, that is still applicable on the DEXA workstation. So this is still connected to the workstation. We call it the TBS agent is actually redesigned. It does exactly the same as the current TBS version does, but the, the user interface looks different, it's easier to uh, work with as a DEXA technologist, it's more intuitive. As a second element, we actually now have the Core Lab, which is a centralized uh, feature that is new for TBS, 
and that is installed on your local hospital server and it actually links the different TBS agents. So you will have a central repository of all the TBS analysis that you're doing and you can access your TBS reports and your analysis centrally uh, through your local network. That also means if you're doing home office in reading your TBS reports or you want to access them from some uh, remote devices like iPads or, or phones, as long as you're in your local network, you will be able to do so. Okay, so I already talked about the improvement of the user interface and the usability design. Another relevant new feature is uh, the improved TBS computation. So uh, the TBS is influenced by the soft tissue over the spine and up to date this is done by correcting for the body mass index, which is great for the majority of population. However, extremely obese patients or very, very thin patients might today get uh, a slight inaccuracy of the result just because the BMI does not fully represent uh, a good correction factor there. And secondly, the BMI is also error prone. It's uh, based on the, the height and the weight, which is meant uh, entered manually by the technician. So it's an error source. And uh, the DEXA scanners, they actually use the tissue thickness uh, or they, they measure the tissue thickness anyway. And uh, so this measure is now used for the, for the soft tissue correction and it uh, increases the precision in those extreme morphologies and it increases or it decreases your source of error. Also the uh, report commenting and report editing is uh, improved. It will be easier and more straightforward to change reports and also the report al uh, alignment and layout is uh, changed. And as I already mentioned, also we now, with the central system, enable an interconnectivity and data exchange between different DEXA systems. If you have a PACS and you want to just work with your PACS, you don't need to work through the central system. It can run quietly in the background. You don't need to access it. But if you don't have a PACS or you want, uh, or like for example, you have your DEXA unit installed in a rheumatology practice, or endocrinology practice and you don't have a PAGS, you can also use the Core Labs user interface. And then we also now are at the state of the art of cybersecurity database protection. We have in included now all these features and uh, also the, the subscription model or the, the licensing is being updated. And why are we doing all of that? Why are we doing all of that by just providing the TBS? Well, there is one big thing that also Greg mentioned. Um, we want to lay the foundation to actually break out of the boundaries of the DEXA universe. So as we said already, TBS is already here. TBS will be improved to actually pick up on those patients who are incompletely diagnosed if they only have a, a BMD. But what about those 70% of patients who would be osteoporotic, but actually they never see a DEXA scan. So here comes our new product uh, into play that is currently uh, in development, which we call as a internal name ASXR. And this is actually screening for TBS and BMD on X-rays. So any kind of X-ray that contains at least two vertebra, two lumbar vertebra, can be screened and assessed for um, uh, uh, bone health status based on BMD and TBS. And uh, last but not least, we are also looking into leveraging the uh, TBS in the orthopedic world because uh, implant revision or implant instability is a huge topic. And as we said, the TBS is an independent parameter of bone quality, so it can also help orthopedists or orthopedic surgeons to improve the quality of their implants. So that's also down in the pipe. And with that, I'm at the end of this short introduction, and uh, Greg and I are happy to take your questions. The updated uh method for uh, trabecular bone scoring, Yes. does that include a combination of body mass index and, and uh, distance? And tissue thickness? Yeah, tissue thickness. No, it's either or. 
So uh, a customer in a new version can choose to stay with the body mass index correction, um, which, you know, it's very good for the vast majority of the population. Uh, but if you switch to tissue thickness, you will get very similar results for the vast majority of the patients. It's really only at the extreme morphologies that uh, this will give you a leverage to have more precise results. And additionally, also this will enable us to extend the TBS to the pediatric population, which so far we weren't able to because BM, uh, BMI doesn't correlate uh, with uh, children. But if is there, a, is there a certain type of patient where you're better off with the body mass index than with just the measurement? No, uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, BMI being used as a surrogate of tissue thickness. So instead of to use a surrogate, you go directly to the tissue thickness just to make it more accurate. So there is no situation, so to speak. Uh, where there is some potential situation is adding BMI as an independent clinker with factors, but then that will be embedded already in a FRAX, for example. Beside that, no. My question is um, about the, the new software who detects uh, uh, an X ray, mm -hmm. the, the, the bone density and the trabecular bone score. Sure, both yeah. You can get both information. Yes. Uh, as it's like a surrogate of BMD and uh, microarchitecture yeah. that you can have uh, from. Uh so, so, what we do is uh, uh, we trained an AI algorithm to understand BMD and TBS uh, on X-rays. So in the beginning, we used paired images of uh, X-rays and DEXA scans, where, of course, in the DEXA scan, we have the BMD and TBS information. And then we trained uh, with uh, these CNN models how this actually looks like on X-rays. And uh, so this is now what the new product will represent, also this combination of BMD and TBS, because we, as we established before, um, to only to BMD would only give you um, incomplete information. On the other hand, if you only do TBS, you also get only half of the picture. So it actually only makes sense to put uh, both. You, you have the information from the XA in any case to, to develop this model. Yes, okay. so a DEXA is used as a ground truth to, to learn, to, to train these models. Correct, yes. But uh, please mention it's not uh, uh, FDA approved yet. So this is still, this <laughs> is still in okay. development, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you.